So I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you because as we know, but listeners may not know, you and I are currently producing a, a movie together. We are yes, producing we are. partners. And yes, we are. Uh, you're probably the first person I've had on the show who I'm directly and currently working with very, very closely. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, yeah. So <laughs> I would <laughs> love for you to take us to the beginning of, of your journey and how you discovered what the heck this industry and producing. Yes. Well, um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's a little weird because, you know, you're right. We do <laughs> yeah. see each other every day. So it's like, you know, got to put on a little bit of a formal face here, but in general, no it's, formalities it's, needed. <laughs> this is, this is thank, a chill space. Thank you. It's lovely to, to be here. I'm, as you know, a fan of your podcast and I'm a fan of Thanks. our conversations. So it's uh, pretty cool to kind of combine these and, um, I appreciate you for your time. Uh, but, um, Kind of the concise nature of it is I was born in Iran, um, post-revolution Iran, and I moved around from a pretty young age, uh, lived in Dubai, uh, before it was really Dubai, um, Istanbul, uh, Frankfurt. I went to uh, preschool in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown. Uh, it was a pretty interesting experience, you know, uh, to be four years old and to be, you know, generating memories and living in DC, which is a really interesting ethnic hub of the United States. And for me to kind of start to grow and foster my idea of what America is through Georgetown and DC in the early nineties was um, really interesting for me. You know, my, uh, my uncle had a smoke shop in the middle of Georgetown and this is like early nineties Georgetown. So it's a little different. And, um, I just hang out there in the middle of the night and at like two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, um, you know, play drums on like makeshift drums and eat pizza. You were older with, at this point with You're the homies. It's like five. I was like five, but <laughs> okay. I'd still, I'd just so roam impressive. around. Wow. I know I was like, I was roaming around the streets and just really inundating myself with um, a different culture, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I was, you know, I moved around a lot when I was young, but like DC and Georgetown and like some of the early American isms that were, you know, washed over me being that young and being a sponge, it really started to, um, open my perspective, uh, creatively, culturally, societally. Um, and then r right after I finished, just before first grade started, or, you know, my family decided to move to Canada. So I went to Toronto, Vancouver, did the whole Canadian thing and played hockey and, um, uh, ended up moving right after high school from Vancouver to LA to, uh, go to film school and start my career in the business. I knew from a very early age, not too early. I mean, not that any of that shit really matters. <laughs> we can swear ish on the Absolutely. podcast. Absolutely. Right? Great. Oh yeah. Um, I, you know, I knew from a, from a, from a pretty early age, like I was interested and curious in cinema and in art. Um, I grew up in my family business, which is, uh, corporate and residential real estate development and um, investment banking, et cetera, in the Middle East. So I had a lot of exposure to business, which I'm very um, humble for and grateful for because it helped me sharpen my knife and be able to wear mm -hmm. that hat in this business, you know, mm -hmm. being able to balance creative and business affairs. So Super important. Um, very important. So it was very mm -hmm. helpful in that regards. And um, it's uh, good to have those type of long teeth coming into a business like this. And then I, um, I, when I moved down here, I was, you know, I just turned 18 and listen, like I grew up on 60s, 70s, 80s, international and domestic cinema. Um, everyone from the new wave of Iranian post-revolutionary cinema to Chinese new wave, Taiwan new wave, uh, Southeast Asian, Eastern Europe. I cut my teeth on a lot of Kiara Stami movies and, uh, Kaislowski and uh, and uh, um, uh, Jafar Panayi, Api Chapong, um, of course, on the domestic side, a lot of Alan Pakula movies, uh, Polanski, Coppola, uh, Oliver Stone. I think Oliver was definitely the filmmaker that oriented my creative velocity and trajectory and understanding that 
cinema is a pretty lethal form of uh, societal and cultural change. Mm, um, yes, you know, his work, right? His work, that, yeah. yes, his work from the mid 80s to the mid 90s was really a spur- like a, a almost indefatigable, untouchable run of, I think, 10 or 11 movies in 10 years, like Platoon, El Salvador, Born on the Fourth, uh, Born on the Fourth of July, Wall Street, JFK, Nixon, um, uh, talk radio, and they all had a mission, you know, for me to kind of look at a movie like Platoon, because we're, you know, uh, on the Western side of thinking, the movies that we are s- given the art form that we're given when it comes to, you know, the uh, American military isms and the American military industrial complex is very much in line with like the Saving Private Ryan's and the uh, Clint Eastwood's of the world and no disrespect. Like I, I love and I appreciate and respect those filmmakers, but it's um, through an American exceptionalistic lens, which, mm. you know, I don't always agree with and what I really respect in Oliver, even though I don't think he's quite on the same trajectory now but what I really respected in watching a movie like Platoon and growing up and understanding the complexities of global warfare was that um, uh, it's not what it seems and don't listen to what they feed you and do your homework you know the information is there for you to truly realize what these uh, affairs and these, you know, uh, this theater of war is for, and ultimately, of course, it's all for the, you know, for the greenback, for the money. And anyway, bef- besides we get down that, b- before we get down that rabbit hole. So <laughs> I really cut my teeth on those yeah. types of filmmakers, you know, and, mm. um, and, and more so in high school, cutting my teeth on reading and understanding, you know, the, the fundamentals of the story. And I grew up in a lot of, James Elroy books and Donna Tartt and Cormac McCarthy and um, and um, and Raymond Chandler. I loved, I love a good, I love a great thriller. Graham Graham Greene, um, David Foster Wallace. Mm-hmm. Really, just trying to understand, like you know, again, the fundamentals of storytelling, but also the fundamentals of the human condition. You know, like that's again been another pillar of mine and trying to understand my creativity and the stories I want to tell and the missions that I set for like, you know, the slate, it's ultimately, you know, what is the conversation? You know, when you watch um, Chloe Zhao's The Writer, who's another one of my favorite filmmakers, what conversation is she engaging the audience with? You know, are in to me, The Writer is, at, you know, in some sense, a meditation on craft. And, yeah. and what you sacrifice for your craft, because ultimately it is a, um, there's a line to happiness there, you know, even if it means uh, paralyzing yourself. And it's really a right. beautiful meditation on that. All the way down to, you know, watching the parallax view. And it's like, you know, what's the conversation there? You know, don't trust your government. You know what I mean? So again, <laughs> yeah. so again, you know, these were, this were, this was where my mindset was and my, in my in my teens and in my early 20s and coming to LA and wanting to and I, I'm missing so many filmmakers like Kubrick and Hitchcock and a lot of other uh, authors that I really cut my teeth on but generally it was all about the mission it was all about what is the effect on society what is the effect right. on culture like I, I, I love big scale movies but for me as you know like when you're going to die on the top of a hill for a film you know is it going to be something that can speak far far longer than what your legacy is and ultimately you know can it breathe and sustain with earth uh, in a long term you know without sounding too too pretentious you know so how do you how do you go from you know you have been working in your family business in the middle east and you got to have this other aspect of your development right with the business affairs sort of understanding of how to fundraise and how to spend money and budget and all that stuff so how do you let go of all of that which probably seemed very safe and in some Mm -hmm. senses potentially easy to stay on that course Mm -hmm. and then pivot into something that is very uncertain and then you know the kinds of films you're describing these art tours the 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 kind of creatives that get into it for the craft and not for the money right you're not 
passionate about Fast and the Furious, like you're passionate about these movies, like you said, are conversation starters. They move the Correct. needle on cultural, they're, they're cultural shifting kinds of films. So it seems like such a departure from where you were headed. So how right. do you get to that crossroads and go, I'm going to leave all of this behind and I'm going to go and venture into this wildly uncertain, unknown, yeah. faraway land that is Los Angeles and I'm yeah. going to make it work. So like, w I guess the question is what gave you the confidence or the impetus at the time to leave all of that behind and go try something that was so uncertain? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, the root of that was having incredibly supportive parents, you know, mm. and which I'm, I don't know if I will truly understand it until I'm a parent myself, but their support was again, indefatigable and a pillar, you know, I, I am an only child and like, I can't understand what the thought process emotionally and spiritually and mentally of what my parents had to process or understand of like you know he he has this passion and it's been a burning passion a a compounding passion a organic passion mm. um for a long time and they you know they they opened those doors for me in a sense of you know they allowed me to absorb myself in a lot of creativity and a lot of reading and watching movies and and allowed for a very uh liberal type of home in that sense mm. you know and yeah. it, it all it starts from them you know like from the sincerest depths of my heart i don't know if i would have been here without their support particularly because i'm the first of my name in america you know i um i had to not only bear the uh guerrilla force of the United States immigration, immigration system, but also, you know, build a foundation that is, you know, s soil and seed in America to start the legacy for my name and my generation. And again, yeah. not to sound like ostentatious in any way, but like, that was the risk my parents were taking. They were like, instead right. of staying in Canada, instead of coming back to the Middle East, and continuing to work in the family business like we're going to let you fly and breathe and we're going to support you and we don't understand the nature of the business or the complexities or the machinations yeah. of it but like we support you because this is where your heart is and we're not going to get in the way of that and i and again like that type of integrity and that type of um um wisdom and foresight as as a mother and a father, like, I think that was what gave me my strength to yeah. make that decision to, to come here. Yeah. That was one, that was one. The other one was, is, is not was, but is my unyielding impenetrable passion for storytelling and film yeah. and, 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 and books and interactive arts and art and all that. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's something that I found solace in and being in uh, an only child and, you know, being mostly a pretty independent um, um, uh, internal, you know, I guess in introverted person. Like I just yeah. much rather always, you yeah, know, if I, yeah. if I wasn't, if I wasn't working, you know, cause I started at a very early age or if I wasn't playing hockey or handling school, like I was just home by myself watching movies man yeah. you know like it was just yeah I have you know like I you know you understand that's yeah that's, that's it it's just that so then that passion so then you flew to LA you, you were a little birdie you got to fly all the way from Canada to LA and then what at what point did producing come into your world and how did that journey start for you I, st I moved down to LA to write and direct and produce um you know, we've had this conversation briefly, like, at, you know, at some point in my career, I'd love to be in a position to direct. Um, I mean, I don't want to say again, because I've only worked on sh shorts, and those were like, you know, 10 plus years ago, but directing is ultimately at the root of my creative endeavors, but producing is something that encompasses 
all of my passions. Again, creative affairs, business affairs, yeah. um, building a team, collaborating with the team, find, you know, finding ways to not just empower the team, but for the team to empower you. It's just, mm. you know, all the stuff that we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Um, you know, th those were the things that were very um, attractive to me and intoxicating. Um, so when I'm, when I started writing and directing and, you know, made a few shorts that got a lot of cool acclaim around the, around the continent and opened a lot of doors for me and helped me really, you know, at that time there was a huge divisive conversation around digital and film and, um, you know, photography is something that I've loved. So that was an element that I was really involved in with Panavision with Kodak and championing the support of film. Um, it was a lot more polarizing of conversation then than it was now. Mm -hmm. I think now folks have accepted that, like, you know, if it's in the purview of your budget or creative, like you can make it work. Um, but I, um, you know, th that was the start and then transitioned from there through, you know, just like I said, the tediousness of immigration here and had to restructure a lot of what I wanted to do and ultimately landed in full-time producing um, in an independent sense, entrepreneurial sense, and um, with my three partners. And we started our company um, about five years ago, almost now. Um, we were working together for a couple of years. What does 5-4 stand for? So 5-4 is essentially is the... Company? Yes, 5-4 is the FIV, FIVE 4 slash 4. It's the time signature. It's the musical time signature um, of, uh, you know, the, the anomalistic time signature, the majority of it is in 4-4 four, four, and 5-4 is uh, an anomaly. And that's kind of, again, in a metaphorical sense, you know, what we, what we attempt to do with our work and us being, you know, agnostic in a genre sense, but mission-based, you know, like yeah, we're looking, yeah. we're looking for commerciality, but like more so it was what I was telling you about at the top of our conversation, you know, what is the, what is the conversation? What is the discussion? What is the, what are the elements that you want to discuss? You know, I learned pretty early on in this business that, you know, you don't want to create anything that is answering questions because mm. that's, uh, that's ultimately it's ultimately counterproductive in a sense. Well, it's you not know, what art is for, right? Art right. is supposed to raise questions. Raise that questions. In the, best, in the best of scenarios, you walk out of that experience, whether it's a, a, a film or an art show or a, an interactive performance with a conversation you can have with the people you just had exactly. that experience with. And hopefully exactly, those dude. conversations transpire into like – change and action and shifting exactly. up perspectives yeah e exactly exactly yeah. it's like we already have a pretty intense deficiency of education in the united states i mean frankly in the world you know the yeah. idea of the idea of liberal arts has been you know transmogrified into like some sort of like political or institutional belief of being you know um uh, smarter or you know again intellectualism has has been has been morphed into a negative, you yeah, know? Yeah, and yeah. I, I, again, I don't mean to sound uh, pretentious. It's just like, you know, this simple idea of education and learning and having doubt of the system. Critical thinking. I, critical, critical thinking. thinking. I think and I don't mean lost, like, yeah. Yeah. I don't mean like tinfoil conspiratorial conversations. <laughs> I mean, just like basic, like did, did rabbit hole. Did yes. America, you know, because it's the 75, 75th anniversary, did America really need to drop the atomic bombs in Japan? Absolutely not. The war was right. over. It was a fucking sign. It was a signal. It's important for our generation to know this and learn this because ultimately history is our future. You know, our past right. is our prologue. Well, yeah. and, and it's, it's like, also written, it's also written by the, the winners usually, right? So we never to see the full. Of course. America's two-time World War champs, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and that, you know, all that bullshit which we'll talk about in a second and again a yes. hopefully concise way but um anyway so made the transition into full-time producing creative producing um started our company which is you know fully fledged uh, uh creative you know we finance the packaging we finance development um and um and you know we have a couple of uh, exciting you, things going for next year how do you define producing Oh man! Um, I should do a compilation of every time I've asked this question, and then every person's reaction is the same. It's always same. Like, 
it's like this yes. labor of it's, thought. It's difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. difficult in a sense because it's multiple things, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, writing and directing in a non-dismissive way are very focused, singular lanes. You know, you're, you're doing a fucking million things at once as a writer and a right. director, but like they're definable in a sense. Uh, you know, as a producer, it really depends. You know, I think, as you said, every individual has a different outlook on what producing is. And I think, you know, for what me, is your outlook? Yes. for me, it's creative first. You know, like nothing fucking matters. if It's not creative first. You know, this whole business, I understand it's a business and, you know, the ultimate color of power is the color of the greenback. But like ultimately, you know, even that is like a little bit of, you know, uh, hyperbolic bullshit. Ultimately, the creative, the story, the writer, like that's the root. You know, yeah. for me, producing comes from the written work. You know, I have like umpteenth respect for writers and it's insane how the future film world treats writers you know, uh, um, but like, you know, it's like real estate. The nucleus of real estate is location. The, the, the nucleus of our work is writing. So for me, the root of producing is the written work, is the story. So honing and fostering your voice, your voice as a storyteller. For me, producing starts with what do I want to help tell? What, what story? What, where do I want to shine a spotlight? You know, where what 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 do i ultimately want to tell if i'm taking this five plus year endeavor most of the time on a story from the very root you know and for me that's what the beginning that's what the nucleus of producing is story 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 and then filmmakers you know and then the individuals that are going to execute that story and interpret it um right all the business affairs and like fucking crazy packaging bullshit you know we deal with it every day that stuff that stuff like again not being dismissive in any way like those are elemental pieces and and parts of putting together a film but you know the intangible the kind of ethereal element of it all is the story is your voice Mm -hmm. like your subjective voice on like what type of stories you want to tell you know and it takes time it takes time to it's, to, it's all you to foster have. I mean, that. We we talk about this a lot, it, it, most almost all the time. But like this idea of taste and that, as a producer, really, it's the one thing you have that makes you intrinsically you. Because a lot of this other Correct. stuff, right, can be learned. Like you can learn financing and structures and how to, um, you know, the physical side, which is where I come. You can learn all of the nuances of that and union rules and all of that. But like your taste is what inherently that's the intangible you. correct that's the intangible and it, it it just had a guest on the last week's episode which i don't know when this will air but we you know it reminded me of this ira glass quote about taste and the gap between the taste that you you have when you get into something creative and your expectations of where how you're going to be execute at the level of the taste that got you into the game in the first place a hundred percent at the ground floor doing something that's going to take you you know 10,000 hours to get to that level where you can finally have the gap between your taste and what you can execute as a creative, fi- like they narrow exactly the where they are one. And what he says is that a lot of people don't know that. And so they give up before they get, before the gap is so narrow that it's imperceptible. And um, I, it's just been something I've been really meditating on this week because it, I just love that quote and it's so true. And while so much of producing can be perceived as not creative by others um, mm-hmm. there is such mystery and mystique between you know what we do i do think it's still a very important part of like keeping that forward momentum for yourself for your soul which then you can help inject in the the collaborations that you have with your filmmakers and it's an right. important like sort of ping pong exchange and if you're not also uh, on that wavelength i think it makes the journey that much harder and as we know it, you know the independent film hustle is is not for everybody it is not no for the it's not of heart you know it's not it's it's not yeah. you know it requires a very different constitution you know you yeah. are Will you, you are, speak to that yeah yeah you're 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 you know you're honing in on again your inter your inner constitution your makeup your construct as an individual and are you set for it and again 
I have a lot of respect for my friends and our colleagues who work within the institutional side of the business, you know, the, the machinery side of the business that requires its own finesse, it requires its own diplomacy, its own politics. Ultimately, the essence of democracy is compromise. And I think, mm. you know, you really need to hone in on that philosophy to be able to succeed, not just as an independent producer, you can still be unfucking compromised. I mean, you can be unfucking compromising, <laughs> but you still need to have an essence of yeah. compromise and diplomacy to get the project made. Because I've seen filmmakers who are inimitable in their talent, but get in their own fucking way. They're self-destructive. I think one of the most beautiful projects ever made, sincerely ever made, at least one of the best in the past decade, was Alex Garland's illustration of Annihilation because it completely deals with self-destruction, you know? And I watch that film frequently to remind me and be and let it be a cautionary tale of self-destruction mm. where you need to you need to be uncompromising, but you need to also find the solutions to create and to make and release the work. You know, ultimately you need to be able to share it and put it into the world so that conversation How do you do can that? start. How do you do that personally um, for your soul? Uh I don't know how to answer this without sounding again like too metaphysical or philosophical. You need to you need to consistently reassess your relationship with time. You need to consistently reassess your relationship with what defines your happiness, what defines your success, you know? The legacy of a well-made film project the conversation, the legacy of the conversation, you know, the legacy of the conversation of one single project mm. can mean so much as opposed to just releasing 10 films in fucking five years that, you know, are meaningless. No disrespect. Every time you release a movie, you got to fucking, you know, send a prayer up to the film gods but <laughs> you know i it's think true. you need to reassess your relationship with with time with the process you know one of the things that i see really um uh inundate folks with negative and pessimistic thinking is their relationship with the process and again that includes the relationship with time you know what does the process of filmmaking and creative producing mean to you does it mean working towards a result? Does it mean working towards actually being able to share a really brilliant project, a story? Those are two very different things. You yeah. know, it takes it takes time. You have to dance with the pro with the process. It is a fucking dance. You but know, it, it's not so a it's not a race. It's a dance. You know, that's it's interesting. That's I always I always think of it as a marathon, but I like the idea of a a dance much yeah better. because with a marathon like listen it, it is it is ultimately a marathon but there's a finality to a marathon a dance mm -hmm. can technically go on so long as you have endurance you know you need balance and you need rest but endurance supersedes everything you know i'm paraphrasing a james baldwin quote but he says that you know most of all you need endurance you know you can have talent fucking spewing out of you like yeah oil out of the fucking Saudi, you know, uh, oil fields, but it doesn't mean shit if you don't have endurance, if you don't have um, passion for the process, because as yeah, you know, yeah. this business punches you in the face, independent film producing punches you yeah. in the face every single day in 14 different ways. And yes. you need to, you need to reassess, you know, your, your love and your inner constitution, you know, and if you have some yeah. of those pillars that I was talking about, you know, your love for story, um, your love for the process, you know, and there, these aren't answers, by the way, Kato. These are, these are, again, these are relationships with yourself. The relationship with you and the process of independent mm. filmmaking is a relationship that needs fostering, just like yeah. a fucking plant. You can't just wake up one day and be like, well, I got Dude, it. Dude, blowing my mind. I think you, I feel like maybe your beard is turning you into a wise <laughs> sage of some sort because nice. it, I mean, you're, you're, you're saying all the things like you're, you're nailing it. And I, 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 for the listeners, you know, I just, we, 
I talk so much on the show about the frustrations and the hardships and the challenges of having the stamina, having the endurance for this dance that is mm-hmm. this path. And I think one of the, the biggest takeaways, uh, having been working with you now since like February, is how much you've been instrumental in this season of my my own journey and helping lift me up and helping me get insight and understand different parts of the process of producing that I had not uh, known about so intimately. I sort of knew on a general scale, but like getting to work with you on this film that we're working on together, like you teach me so much of this stuff every day, but more importantly, I, I often joke that I feel like I should just be paying you because you're, you, you constantly right. provide, you know, a, 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 like this sort of inspiration and infusing and reminding me of the why and reminding me of like to keep going. And in that way, to me, that is that is a form of mentorship, peer to peer mentorship that I've I've been seeking my whole career. And I feel like I, I have glimpses of that with the podcast. And I, I really do believe everyone who comes on the show mentors me for that one hour. And hopefully the listeners feel the same. But with you, it's so special because it's been a gift that has kept on giving. And every time I'm spiraling out or I'm like, fuck this, I want to burn it to the ground. Why did this person email me back? Why isn't this happening? And just like, Wusa, you know, just kind of like reminding you. And I think part of that endurance that you speak of is having people in our lives and in our journeys, whether they're in the business or not, who can kind of help you navigate that. Oh, that's what the, the, that's the opposite side of it. You know what I mean? That's happiness. That's success. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be superficial and super fucking self-righteous and say like, yeah, the, the, the critical and commercial success and the fucking awards and all that. Yes. It's a part of the legacy and it is a part of what we do this for. But again, at the root, what you just talked about, the camaraderie, Mm -hmm. the creative collaboration, the journey of the creative collaboration, the pains, the sorrows, the heartbreak. Yeah. That's where ultimately, I know it's weird, that's where happiness lies. Not in losing and failing, but in the other side of the mountain and the losing and the failing. Pardon me, uh, I'm not maybe as articulate as I want to be here, but ultimately it is the camaraderie. You talk about our relationship and how that's helped, you know, uh, grow you and your process. The road goes two ways. You know, uh, yeah. you know, I think mentorship works on both angles. It's like how we teach our parents, you know, mm. everyone is yeah. a human being. No one is That's special. Right. No one is That's special. Right. They That's might right. be older. They might have a little bit more tenure, but they're human beings and they breathe the same fucking oxygen as we do. So as much as they can teach us, we can teach them. And I don't mean teach in a prognosticating or a pontificating way. I sincerely mean that in an emotional, into, in an emotional and spiritual way. Uh, because yeah. that's a part of the sustenance, you know, that's a part of the happiness and success for me. I can go through a week of fucking shit in this business where you're constantly going back to the drawing boards and trying to figure out how to get something done, but still be fucking happy because mm. of the people I'm working and collaborating with, because all yeah. it takes is a little bit of that energy, energy. It's the root energy. <laughs> to change everything yeah it's so true it's like it it, it, i feel like being an independent filmmaker you constantly feel like you're operating on such highs and lows it's like you're always in the extremes of everything you could literally have in the morning like the worst news of the day and then by the end of the day have the best news of the day and it could be something it's insignificant truly but it just fills you up with that energy and gives you that burst to like keep going another day to keep going keep doing the dance believing that it's all going to lead you to to a place where you eventually can share that dance with others you know and just here's here's the thing we created but I think you know I want to shift gears for a bit because so much of this show is talking about the the hardships and and really shining a light on on the unglamorous unsexy parts of the 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 work that it takes the, real the fun. self the self work you know what i mean yeah. like the, to actually yeah. have that stamina and keep going it's like i'm about to have my tw- my my 14th year la anniversary and it's like whoa i i feel so 
grateful that I'm still here. I, I, and I haven't become a cynical asshole in the process. I don't think correct Mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, but you know, like it's so important to me to give listeners and, and anyone who cares to be a part of this conversation, true understanding into those challenges and then how my guests like navigate those, those moments and those ups and downs and find that strength to keep going. Even when you haven't necessarily had people on your corner that maybe could have like given you that boost you know how do you go within yourself and find that strength to keep going so what Mm -hmm. what are some of the biggest challenges so far in your career that you faced that really threw you off your center and you just like bounce back like and how did you Um, do that that's a great question I mean I think a I think a big part of this business is again, like reassessing your relationship with expectations. You know, I think that's a big part again, just like any relationship, right? You know, um, expectations can lead you down, um, unproductive paths. Uh, And I think, you know, reorienting your expectation has been big, you know, thinking that just because you were able to attach so-and-so element, it's going to create some sort of insane amount of fluidity towards getting the project to production, that's a fallacy of expectation where you're like, wow, even though I'm working with so-and-so who has so-and-so behind them, it's still, you need to, um, you need, you know, your confidence has to be infectious when you're putting a project together, right? So one of the most challenging parts of a project is, you know, breathing new life cycles and a, runway of stamina into that project for example i have a uh, project that we're going to be idealistically shooting in q4 of 2021 in new york um following our project it's a little bit bigger than what we're doing and um it's a challenging project in many um physical producerial and creative producerial ways and it's been a journeyman's type project um, but it's a beautiful sensitive and tender story about a homeless um, black underground artist and how uh, you need and the, the essence of the story is about reconciling your trauma reconciling your past to be able to hone into your gift and be able to share that gift with the world because ultimately even if you recognize your gift it's meaningless if you can't share it with the world and that's what is at the center of this project you know there's a lot of uh, societal and cultural connotations and metaphors and allegories but ultimately the root of it is reconciling your past to be able to share your gift and um, it's been challenging challenging because from the very first days of the project when I had folks tell me that I can't get your movie financed because there's a black guy on your poster Mm -hmm. you know and I'm very sure those same individuals have a different perspective these days (laughs) and and they're singing a different tune and whether it's (laughs) for performance or bottom line purposes I think they woke up and smelled the fucking green behind minority based stories. Yeah. You know, we and we'll get to this when we discuss, you know, some of the deeper legacy conversations, but ultimately it's all a fucking concept, right? It's a construct. It's just like capitalism. It was something created. It wasn't a fucking beam yeah. from the ethers, right? Like this but, idea but lot, that skin right? color like, Yes. Yes. Bullshit. But, but to just get back for a second, like all of this, yes, but I'm I'm just curious how then you personally with this insurmountable pressures of that and all for whether for an individual project or all of the projects but how do you navigate all of that and find the strength and the endurance to keep going to keep pushing through because it's like at every turn there's a, ro- a new roadblock yeah. right uh there's about two or three things i think to get super specific one is the team you're working with mm-hmm. if you're wor- you know let's just kind of take it project by project if you're in a place that's super challenging on a project and you're getting a lot of just passes or pushback or you're just getting a lot of feedback that's like it's going to be fucking tough to make this film again you need to have like an internal conversation of am i trying to reach for something that is truly just improbable and i'm wasting my bandwidth on it or is it something that i will fucking die on the top of the hill for if you internally trigger that part of your brain and you again constitutionally fucking feel that you will find a way. 
Yeah. That's one part of it. The other part was the team you're working with. If you're working with people that you can fucking go to war with, be in the trenches with, have tough conversations with, be vulnerable with, know that at the end of every tough conversation, that relationship is only getting stronger and you're working towards this one goal, which is sharing the work with the world, you will find the way. And ultimately, the very last one is what we've discussed. Passion. Passion, passion, passion. You know, if I'm in a shitty place and I'm having a tough time, we're fucking human beings. We have blood coursing through our veins. I watch my favorites. I go back and I read and I watch my fucking favorites. It instantly fucking catalyzes a boost of energy and inspiration in me that takes me to the next day. And I'm like, I'm fucking prepared. What's (laughs) the issue? What's the issue? There's a solution. Ready to go to battle. Where every problem is a human made problem. Ergo, every problem has a human made solution. Mm. that's it (laughs) you know (laughs) so it's like these are these are some of the concise pillars I go back to when I'm like fucking desperately trying to like find some breathing space in a project that's just got a lot of pressure especially on the projects that we want to tell that might go against the conceptual grain yeah you know? and when you're not telling you know big commercial stories that the stamina to ha- you have to have to believe in these seemingly smaller intimate stories that really um like, as, like you said cr- have create and pose questions to the to the viewer is a much harder path but like for sometimes sure. you watch a piece of art that just really at least for me it could be a new experience it doesn't have to be me going back to something i love that's like comfortable but it's it, it infuses me and it reminds me of like, wow, there's other people also fighting the good fight and getting these kinds of stories made. Like last yeah. night I watched Peanut Butter Falcon. Finally, it's been recommended Fucking awesome. for years. And I was <laughs> like, oh my God, like this yeah. movie is yeah. why I do this. You know, like yeah. these kinds of stories, that's right. This yeah. is real. This is possible. Yeah. This can and should exist. And how does it make how- you feel? How does it make it, you feel after watching that? Like, how I mean, does it make it makes your you heart feel, feel incredible? It makes yeah. me like want to cry that uh, there are people out there, you know, who are willing to be brave enough to put up capital and time and talent to go and tell a story that isn't, it isn't going to necessarily be a sexy viewing experience, but it is about the human condition. And it is only through art that we can change perspectives and we can, and we can in a safe sort of space bring new light into a subject matter or a a a, a lifestyle that yeah. we may not really know anything about and just have a completely it gives empathy you know it's it allows us to empathize with and there it is yes. there's the word and there it is you know? and so it, but it just that's those are the moments that i'm like when it gets hard i just remember that there are many movies like that like short term 12 uh Beautiful. Anomaly, some of my favorite movies Beautiful. you know that just really speak to this idea and really just infuse me with hope for humanity and hope for us to like use our stories to to shine a light on the realities not just the positive fluffy you know kind of glossy aspect of life but all all of it i think is important yeah. and um yeah but so so to that to that point you know i know we yeah. we've talked off mic a lot about you being from the middle east and how how people from the middle east tend to be perceived in cinema <laughs> Especially yes. American cinema. And, oh, yes. You know, and there's so many incredible Iranian films that, like, have nothing to do with terrorism or any of that. And, and we have bonded over this thing, too, where I feel like being Brazilian, we don't need any more movies about the favelas or the corruption in the political, like, climate. We, we've seen those. We get it. It's still there. It's still real. It's still an issue. Let's address it. Let's try to find a better way. But I want to see other stories of the human condition out of these countries because I know they're real, we know they're real, and I want others, Americans especially, people who aren't as traveled, who, who only see fear when they think about the Middle East, to, to like just, again, empathy, show them a whole new perspective on how we're more connected than separated. And so yes. um, I just monologued, but yeah, will you speak yes. to that a no, little bit? No, it's, listen, I, you know, sometimes, you, you you have to be diplomatic in how you express or articulate your feelings on something like this, considering how culpable our business has been in yeah. orienting the perspective of Americans, you know, particularly Caucasian Americans towards their feelings of the Middle East. You know, I think 
I think one of the pillar export, you know, I mean, the granddaddy cultural export of America is Hollywood, right? Yep. Yep. And um, it's something that America reveres and they wear it on their sleeve that like, you know, our cultural export of Hollywood is significant and it is, but it also is prejudice. It's racist. Mm. It's um, conceptually backwards in many ways. And again, kind of trying my best to choose my words carefully here because being political, there's a lot of individuals in our business who are of high rank and tenure who have been culpable. Capital C, culpable. From the agencies to the studios to the networks to the filmmakers. I mean, A-list individuals across every element of this business has been fucking culpable in orienting a global view of particularly fucking brown people, particularly after 9-11, and you think about the codependency of interests in which films like American Sniper Mm. and Lone Survivor serve. Yeah. No no disrespect to those filmmakers, but I'd love to share a couple of glasses of scotch and sit down with those filmmakers and ask them questions about their perspective of brown people. Now, of course, we're in the middle of an uprising, at least I hope it's a sustainable uprising with respect to Black Lives Matter and Black voices and Black creatives and Black filmmakers. And I think not only is that obviously necessary, it's overdue and it's just fucking insane to me how a country that has literally been galvanized off the back of black labor they haven't given them their equity or their equality yeah to me giving them voting rights in 68 is the basic fucking minimum it's drinking water yeah that's like you given you finally gave them a chance to drink fucking water in 68. yeah so the fact that 50 years later we're still dealing with this type of proto-fascist bullshit is again our business is culpable yeah so I, I, you know, there's no point in naming names, A, because I don't want to jeopardize the future of my fucking business, <laughs> yeah, no. because don't that's just, un- under the bus, that's but, just, but. yeah, that's just unfortunately how this business works in some sense. But ultimately, my biggest goal as a filmmaker, my biggest goal as a creative producer, as an individual in this business is to bridge that fucking divide, is to mm-hmm. find as many local Iranian, Qatari, Arab, uh, Israeli, uh, Lebanese, Uh, goodness what they're going through right now Uh, Iraqi Afghani Pakistani I mean I'm missing countries but I want to find them there there and help bridge the divide in bringing and telling their stories on a global scale now I'm not arrogant or ignorant I understand that you know there's a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, individuals in the Middle East that work hand in hand with the um, you know uh, neo-hawk mil- military industrial complex folks in this country and they work hand in hand to you know grow this theatrical war to grow yeah. this ever you know evergreen bottom line approach um as i said it's a codependency of interests but this country america that positions itself as the as the you know grand altruistic country grand altruistic culture and society of freedom i mean freedom is a fucking paradox but uh, this grand altruistic system the way particularly after 9 11 this business has oriented its storytelling against middle easterns has been infuriating and i look forward to the day that i can help and be a part of systematically institutionally and creatively changing that and i already I mean, am and i have it, friends yeah. that are already are there are I mean, agents think, in this business think, that are i need yeah. to be you know i need yes, to say that it, it has it is it is unfortunate that it's like in the it feels like in the recent years it's like that is starting to happen and i think you know so grateful for shows like rami on hulu which is sure. all about it's it's all about 
like navigating being a Muslim, you know, in New York and like in your 20s. And I, I knew nothing about Muslim. I knew nothing really about Egyptians, really. And so ignorant of me. I'm also an immigrant. But like how much of that show, how oh, much of the struggles. That's the power my of own that, experience, yeah. you know, that's the it power of storytelling. Right. Exactly. That's exactly. the power. That's the power. Yeah. And it's like it's like Haifa Al-Mansur is one of my favorite fucking filmmakers. She did this movie, I think, five years ago called Wajda. It's on iTunes for anyone mm. that wants to go watch it. But it's about a young Saudi girl who wants to buy a fucking bike. <laughs> now, God bless Sony Pictures Classic for releasing that movie, if I'm not mistaken, in the U.S. and for championing her. And God bless UTA and Anonymous for representing her. And she's just one of fucking thousands upon thousands. But yeah. that's what I'm talking about. We need to see Americans because when an American, when a unintellectual, excuse me for saying that, but an individual who has either been repressed because of their upra uprising or because of where they live in this country or just generally because of their constitution, yeah. When they watch an American sniper, they will go into the voting booth and they will participate in the concourse of politics different than when yes. they watch a, a Wajda or when they watch Jafar Panoyi's yeah. offside. Yeah, this I is mean, what this is the power of cinema, man. This yes, is what I'm talking about. If you watch about. it, those those stories are getting told, but they're not reaching the kinds of people that could have their perspective. Needs, generally speaking, that needs their to perspectives change. change. And I think like foreign films are an extension of travel like if you can't travel and go be in these environments and go be in these countries and be literally in someone else's world for a minute and step outside your bubble and see what else people deal with like what else their, what their life is like That's you can't have that you know exactly so I think if i could like revolutionize you know the way things are are done here in the states it's like i wish that it, there was a mandatory requirement when you were 18 years old to go spend a year abroad somewhere and immersing yourself in a completely different culture and learning about someone else's experience of the world because you would come back to the States feeling so grateful about the way things actually function and work here and that in all of its imperfections, it's still one of the better places to be, hence why yeah. my family immigrated. Right? I, I but agree. Also, you look at people with a completely different lens. And it, even if you're going back to like your small town in Minnesota or whatever you're from, like you just have, you, you can zoom out and see the world is so much bigger than your hometown, than your, than your state, than your country. Yes. You know, yes. And, and if you yes. see it, literally see it, feel it. Like you're breathing yeah. the same air as these yeah. people. Like yeah. it is then impossible to dehumanize them and devalue their experiences and, I don't know. Yes. I think that's the secret. I think that's the key. And I think because travel has really only since the eighties, if you think about it, become something that most people can finally afford to do. I hope that people in general, but if you're a young person listening, if you're like 17, 18, like the best thing you can do, if you want to be an artist, if you want to be in this business is go out into the world and experience the world because that is how you get your taste. And that is what's going to make yes. you intrinsically you and yes. then all the rest of the stuff, you can figure that out. But if you have nothing to say, if you have nothing to contribute to the conversation, then why are you doing it? And, and maybe you do just want to make money and just want to get rich and you can be the, the one percent unicorns that Great. becomes that. I, I, Great. I hope so. Then get the fuck out of my way. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Go make yeah. your money. Go do your thing. Tell your. Yes. You know, put Mark Wahlberg in your story and let him go shoot a bunch of fucking brown people or put Bradley Cooper yeah. in your story and let him go shoot a bunch of black people wearing a fucking American flag, you know? And yeah. tell that and tell that story and let that contingent of America continue to vote one way, continue to support one line of thinking while the rest of the world progresses. You know, that's just the nature <laughs> of it all. Like you said, cinema, what I again, you talk about a lethal form of change. Cinema is a passport to fucking culture. Cinema is a passport yeah. to uh, to society. It's a passport to travel. Like if you look at um, you look at uh, you know, some of Sebastian Lillio's movies in Chile, and you look at Pablo Lorraine's movies mm. in Chile, you look at uh, Kleber and Karim's movies in Brazil, you talk about not seeing another city of God. That's why I love some of 
clever and cartoons movies in Brazil because they talk about regular Brazilian life. Not that it's not important to spotlight the fucking trials and tribulations, but I also want to see what yeah. a regular fucking Brazilian does in a yes. regular fucking day. That's right. Same That's same right. thing with same thing with Lucrecia Martel and her films in Argentina. I can go down the fucking list. That's what means everything to me. Like for me, being a part of like for me, I think the exemplary example of really interesting top line oriented fucking filmmaking on a studio level is what Matt Reeves did with the apes movies his two apes movies yeah where he took us just a little older because we were apes just evolution and he showed us how nothing has changed on a deeper cognitive biological level it's just fucking concepts (laughs) <laughs> you know yeah and that's what i love and those movies made a fuck ton of money that's who i respect that's the it's type of hollywood at its best, studio right at it's, its, it's best it's but jordan that's Peele, it's get out it's these kinds of movies that can go on to become they're not following any older models of what has existed they're literally going out on the limb taking a risk and all Wait, of more. the gods the movie gods are aligning for this to be something that succeeds more i more do black, want to say we are almost at an hour it's so okay. we have a few more minutes i think you've you've done a wonderful job at, at shining a light on some of the realities of your particular brand of producing how you got started and um i one of the things i i would love for you to touch upon as we as we you know z- z- uh, t- like go away as we finish out this conversation which is just a moment in time conversation it is not at all meant to be a full encapsulation of your career but Mm -hmm. i love this idea of mentorship because we you and i talk about it so much and so i just would love for you to end on on that note of mentorship and leveling up and how to stay the course it it kind of feeds into advice a bit but i think you've you've given very clear advice throughout the conversation so um i i look at you know i try to look at it as just sharing experience not so much you know sharing counsel or advice and for me you know mentorship and the camaraderie of collaboration and the energy and the kind of frequencies of collaboration is everything in this business you know you kind of hear this all the time in the business of you know this business is ultimately a business of relationships you know um you can you know you can sit down and name me all the dps from the 30s and all the directors that directed every single film out of you know hungary but ultimately and i love that I love that. And I'll get into it all day. But ultimately, for me, it's who are you as an individual, you know, and like, and, and that is the key element, you know, time is um, a considerable asset. And every new individual and partner you meet and work with, you know, re reorients your, uh, your relationship with yourself, you know, and yeah. I think ultimately at the end of the day, it is a people to people business. It is a person to person business. You know, I hold my relationships and foster them with incredible detail, with incredible thoughtfulness and mindfulness. They mean a great deal to me, not because I'm looking towards uh, uh, targeting a result with that relationship but at its root growing through that relationship, yeah. whether it's someone on a parallel track with me, like yourself, where we grow 50, 50 together, whether it's my relationships with folks that are at a very different level than I am in this business who can help share their wisdom and their experience. Yeah. Um, ultimately to me, like that's where the happiness and success lies in. Yes, getting the movies released, building a portfolio and and creating more and being able to have the platform to sh- to to go find and foster the filmmakers in the countries and the parts of the world that I want to. That is the long term goal, but it's the work together. It's the work together. It's finding yeah. the right people. That's that's everything in this business. That's yeah. the long term success. That's the long term happiness, well, you know. Uh- yeah, I mean, look, yeah. I think anyone who gets to gets to be lucky enough to have you be a part of their journey, I think oh. is, uh, and I'm not just saying that because it's being recorded, but I, I <laughs> but love I mean you. it. Thank you. <laughs> but I mean Thank it. You. It's it's so 
lovely to just have this moment where we get to share this and record it to share it with a bunch of people that are going to be listening Thank and you. the goal and the dream is that a year from now we'll be on the other side of our movie having we been shot, hopefully be editing and we, we can do a part two and, and sort of talk about that give an experience. update I know. And give an update to the listeners. So I, I just want to thank you so much for the continued advice and guidance, generally speaking, but then also to finding another hour of your life to talk to me more <laughs> in this conversation thank and you. so that we can share it with people. So thank, thank you so you. much for doing this. It means it means a lot to me and I appreciate your time and I appreciate this platform. And I am so happy that you have this platform to share your love and your passion and to have the folks that you've had on to um, have them continue to inspire, um, our community, you know, it's, it's my honor. So the sun you. rises tomorrow. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I love it. Wow. <laughs>